welcome back to another episode of the Widow Podcast. I am super excited to bring along today the lovely Heather Quizzle. You will know Heather from her amazing TikToks <laughs> that she creates on Instagram, not TikToks, Reels. Are you on TikTok as well, Heather? I'm not. No. no. You should be. You're like, you're, you should, you'd be a TikTok genius, but your, your Instagram Reels, I apologize, are absolutely brilliant. Just so creative you tell your story so well and 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 do, do you know what I love about your your reels they they're always you touch on the heartache and the grief and the tragedy that we all feel but they're, they're always with a positive message you, you know you offer that hope that light in a dark place which I think is so important I know I certainly searched I wish you were around when my husband had died you know and and, and found that but anyway you're here, you're with us, and I'm so looking forward to our conversation. So thank you for joining us, Heather. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be just meeting you like in face to face, which, you know, as face to face as we can get. Oh, I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a great way to start my day. So thank you for having Oh, me. bless you. Thank you. So should we start then with, with a little bit about your story, Larry, and, and what happened there? Yeah. Uh, can I just say like, it's so wonderful for somebody to say, tell me about Larry, like, you know, to get these opportunities to just like speak unabashedly. And, um, you know, my husband died. <laughs> um, that's why I'm here. And um, Larry and I met when we were in high school. I fell in love with him at 15. I followed him to college. Um, we built a life and had three kids together and he died at the height of his life. Like the lucky guy, not, you know what I mean? Like he yeah. went out with a bang, like we had the careers and the family and the relationship and, um, you know, we'd achieved all our dreams. He was a very accomplished athlete and he just died one day and um you know left us reeling and and completely unprepared and in a world that we never imagined mm. and um i had been uh before he passed away i had been in coaching and mentoring women in the business space i had been a mindset coach a success coach um and i remember after he died, having this like conversation with myself, like, all right, girl, like you've been coaching and leading mindset and how to lead yourself out of hard situations. Like it's about time to put your money where your mouth is, you know, and, and at the same time, making that decision, like I can die right here with him, you know, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, or I can choose to take this next space and treat it as a challenge. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for me to be happy again? Is it possible for me to lead my children and I into um, uh, joy and freedom mm -hmm. and, and, and peace and things like that? Is it possible to rebuild a life that's beautiful again? And, um, you know, it's not easy. I was super naive, so naive about grief and how it would affect us. But those thoughts entered very, very quickly um, and really paved the way for a lot of decisions I made from there. Did you believe in, in those early days that it was possible for you to rebuild a life that could feel good again? Absolutely. And it had to be like... <laughs> Karen, it had to be possible yeah. because I was not ready at 40 years old to be done with my life. Yeah. I was not ready to be done being young and vibrant and experienced. I wasn't ready to be, you know, cloaked mm -hmm. in, you know, pain and suffering and like this isolated cat lady life that I, you know, imagined was my alternative. Yes, yes. I didn't have an alternative. So what did your, you know, you said you were a, a mindset 
coach and a success coach before. How do you think that helped you in, in your journey through grief? Yeah, I think it was wildly important. It was like this foundation. Um, I think it served me very well. I think it also um, created some snags too, right? Like all great genius has their weaknesses too. But it created this foundation and like a fundamental belief in myself. Mm-hmm. I have used my mind, um, you know, to experience life the way I want to intentionally creating a life that I enjoy living. What makes me think that I can't do this in this scenario too, mm-hmm. you know, and also just okay. like, you know, um, you know, in, in success and, and, and coaching through failures, like you do something once girl do it again you'll do it better next time Mm. you know and not that there's a better Mm. you know to to losing somebody so substantial like that but there's definitely ways to create um beauty um happiness peace Mm. um you know a life that's worth living And I I just knew, I just knew there was, there's a hundred different ways to enjoy life. Do you know what? I think that's so true. And, you know, people have often heard me say that I I am far more fulfilled and aligned in my life now than I have ever been. So to some extent, some people would go, well, is it better then? You you know, but you're right. It's not about it being better. It's different. It looks very different for different reasons because my experience has shaped me and it's it's taken me on this this journey of self-discovery that maybe I wouldn't have been on before. Um, but you know, there's a, a an inner fear when we lose our person and our life is you know shattered into a million pieces, isn't there? That our life can never be good again, you, you know, let alone the thought of better or more fulfilled or whatever word you want to use um because it feels like your best days are behind you but it is so possible isn't it to create something that can be equally as good yes in very different ways but it can it can be good you you know but do you think you have to have that inner belief almost to go and get it because I know a lot of people very much feel like no that's it it's definitely done for me I'm never going to be happy again do you think that that holds you back from being able to achieve something good again well you know the mind will believe anything you tell it Mm. I mean that's like that's truth the mind will believe anything you tell it and I do believe that after loss and in loss and in grief you are your greatest influence Mm -hmm. and you continue to perpetuate suffering or you intentionally work um, to create feelings that move you forward it really is and and trust me in grief like i i have been down the rabbit holes and i'm down them every day and there are thoughts when you know, you you land in thinking patterns and parts of the internet you should never be. Um, that's grief. But then when you have these moments of awareness of where your thinking patterns are, where your heart is, how the darkness has settled in, you make that choice of either staying there and letting that continue or like, I want to feel better. I want to feel differently about this. And for me, the darkness of grief, Karen, I hated it. It's not me. It's never been me. I don't want to be there. I hated the dark side of grieving. The physical just like, like where it's just, it's just literally forcing its way out of you. You're on the floor curled up. You see nothing but fatality for your life for possibility like Mm -hmm. I despised being there Mm -hmm. and and when you get to that point I it it is all it is all in your mind you choose to move through it and start to ask yourself is there a different way I can think about this because thoughts create the feelings 
Feelings create the behaviors, behaviors create the reality. So yeah, the mindset foundation I had wildly helpful. Mm. It didn't stop grief. It didn't shorten it. It it didn't keep me from making some monumental mistakes, Mm. you know, regrets and hindsight. It didn't stop any of that. But this underlying continually like focused on and anchoring on where I was going. I can't see what it's going to look like, but I know I'm going to feel happy. I know I will regain a sense of wholeness. I know I will be able to look at his picture and cherish Mm. versus constant devastation, constant suffering. I think that's so true. And I talk to to my groups about this a lot, obviously, because that, you know, we do get fixed in a certain mindset, don't we? And as you said just there, our brains will believe whatever we tell it and not only that you you know we we tell it a story and then we are going to look for evidence aren't we to back that story up and if you're telling yourself you'll never be happy again of course you're going to find evidence to prove that you 100% you're going to because like you say in your darkest days of grief it's horrendous right you're you're kind of going to go this is awful I am never going to be happy again because you can't see a way out of it but you know if you can still look for the good in those dark moments because it's there isn't it you know we can't always see it and it's maybe not huge it might be tiny little little glimpses of good that we we see but if we can allow ourselves to see those that can help us see that you know if if I can see that feel that now here in my darkest moments then that can only grow as as I work through this and it's so important to remember that but so hard to do when you're on your knees and you're exhausted and you can't get out of bed and you don't want to talk to anyone like what did you do in those moments oh my gosh those moments are the worst Mm. The moments are the worst. And I remember thinking like, I understand how people go into, I don't want to live anymore. Yeah. I understand how people go into drug use just to relieve the physical Mm -hmm. mental experience of it is like, I just remember having this deep compassion, like watching, like being aware of what my own body and mind were going through and just how incapacitating it is. And I look back and I don't know how I got through it, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, I just need to wait this out. Mm-hmm. And in the moment, a lot of times, you you know, there's, there's an impossibility. I, I'm never going to get through it. But somehow you fall asleep and somehow the sun rises the next morning and somehow you have the ability to stand up and get in the shower. Mm. And yeah. I, I think so much, Karen, that we don't understand. And I'm so aware now. I am uh, three and a half years, coming up on four years since Larry passed away. I'm so aware of that even the conversation you and I are having, we are ahead mm-hmm. in this journey than a first year, a second year widow, and how just think differently, you know, everything, you have the ability to do this, you have the ability to feel differently, and just how Mm. ugh that Mm. feels when you're literally on the floor, and you're like, yeah, no, I'm Mm. trying, I'm trying that, and there's no way out of this, and I think one of the things that's important, and this is what I instill in widows, is, is that this thing called grace that we've never really understood at the magnitude that it's required mm. in widowhood and life after loss. Because I, we have it in our heads that like we need to hurry through it. We think that we can hurry through it. We think it, that if we're on our knees again in year three, we're not doing it right. We're behind. We're not letting it go. All these societal messages that we have gotten that say you should never be wailing past the first year you know you should never struggle on his birthday past the third or whatever mental construct we've got here but what i've learned in in this this took me probably two years really to come to this place of being like okay today i'm really attached Mm. to crying i'm really attached to longing i'm really attached to the unfairness and justice of this all 
And I'm just going to let myself be really upset about it today. Yeah. You know, or, you know, I'm really not in the mood to eat, sleep, see people. And instead of getting spun up and putting meaning on that, there's something wrong. I shouldn't feel this way. Yeah. When am I ever going to get over this? Just, okay, I'm just in a pocket of time in which I'm not going to eat or sleep for a while. But, you know, like always believing it's not going to be like this forever. Yeah. You know, give it till Thursday. I may yeah. be like shopping downtown and having a great time <laughs> wearing lipstick. And I think the more we have these sort of realizations that it comes and goes. Yeah. The more you can, the, the easier it becomes to sit in it and wait it out. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're so right. You, you know, it is that acceptance of what is, you, you know, understanding that 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 is your grief. And that's what it looks like now not forever um and allowing that without layering it with that that judgment and that criticism of I'm useless I can't do this it's too hard I'm behind I'm not where I should be all, all these stories and these meanings don't we that we place on it that just add to our suffering that we can reduce you, you know like we are doing that to ourselves because I believe we are a grief illiterate society. Like you've said, we, we are not educated. We don't understand it. We think that we will be sad for a couple of months and, and then it will be all right, won't it? You know, it'd be like- We're grief right. illiterate, but Karen, you and I speak to the high achieving woman who knows how to get things done in her life. Yeah. And she's looking around, not able to change things, not able to move, not producing, not motivated, not filled with passion. These are all things she does not know this life. Yeah. It feels lazy. Mm -hmm. It feels unproductive. It feels weak. Yeah. And so you, com you compound yeah. like the illiteracy of grief and how it's going to affect you with being completely um, unfamiliar with this side of who you now are and unwilling to accept it. Yes, yes. And I was unwilling to accept this new, like this, this like griefy version. And I thought I could just mindset her away and go to the gym and get her back on track. And like, yeah. And yeah. that like losing yourself, like that's a grief I wasn't prepared for the grief of like, I will never be that version of me again that's so hard isn't it that is so hard because it's you know we, we talk about this a lot in grief don't we the secondary losses that, that come with the loss of our spouse and one of the biggest ones is is our loss of self isn't it like who we were and, and I remember after Simon died saying I'm not going to let this change me there's no way I'm going to let this change me I am staying who I am <laughs> And I remember just like being absolutely adamant and, and I fought it. I fought it for two and a half years. Like I was not going to let this change me. And in the end, you know, I had to kind of accommodate those changes because fighting them was just taking up so much energy and it was, it was just destroying me. You, you know, it's like, I wasn't that person anymore. I was trying to be someone I wasn't and I couldn't the be. expectation is so high. Yeah. But you're not operating at that same level with those same luxuries the luxury being you have a stable loving relationship yeah. and you've never had this kind of tragedy in your life yeah. yeah we're trying to operate as if none of this ever happened yes and that's impossible it's, um, yeah two and a half years for you okay and i was like I, I feel like that's how long it took for me to come to like accept this girl and like yeah stop berating her, stop loathing her, um, stop fighting her and allow mm -hmm. her to take shape, allow yes. her to grieve how she grieves, eat how she eats now, breathe and move how she needs to breathe and move today. That I feel yeah, like was a really long haul. It takes a long time, you know, doesn't it? You, you kind of, you don't want it to take that long either. Like you say, you know, in, in our previous lives, we were productive, things happened, we made things change and and we we had an element of control. We, we thought we did. <laughs> um, and, and then you kind of find yourself in this place where you feel completely out of control. Like nothing is, is 
how you want it to be but how do you claw that back and retain part of who you were and the life that you had and still be that productive and and that person it's like you say the expectation that we place on ourselves is huge isn't it absolutely huge and completely unrealistic completely unrealistic and you know, it's I'm I'm sitting here and I'm I'm always thinking of those you know first and second year widows and just the the rawness of the grief and I'm sitting here I've got lipstick on my hair is done I've got a nice blouse on and like I mean the reality is ladies that uh, this will be the biggest thing I do today I'll get back in my pajamas and I may not produce another thing till possibly tomorrow if not two days later yeah you know and 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 and, and being able to understand. Um, the capacity is different, the energy mm. it takes just to process your new world, mm. process who you are, mm. um, how, you know, like constantly divert your mind away from suffering and into something more empowering takes so much energy that we never had to expend before. No, I know. So we, we can worry about our weight. We can worry about, you know, how many times we got to the gym. We can worry about, you know, yeah. Of- out of us you know and uh, energy is going to a lot um heavier burdens these days so did you did you i mean obviously we have to there's so much we have to shift in our minds isn't there in, in terms of how we live who we are how we parent where we go on holiday how we manage our finances like we we like you know in in my my program i, I kind of talk about unlearning everything you thought you knew and then relearning it all in a completely new way because it's, it's like we have to rewire those neurons in our brain don't we like they're they're fixed in this certain way but that doesn't that doesn't work for the life that we have now and the reality that we sit in but it's so hard to do isn't it like you know dismantling those those thoughts breaking them down and then trying to put them back together in a in a way that works for us in the life and the reality that we find ourselves in but but that we don't understand either that you know we're, we're in a world aren't we that we we don't recognize that we don't know so you know where do you start where do you start trying to unpick what you knew and kind of put it back together in a way that that's different so that you can feel a little bit more in control, I suppose, and a little bit more positive about your reality. Yeah. So, um, I spent the last, I don't know, six, nine months trying to like reflect back and put like in a, some sort of strategic order, like what is healing look like? What have, how have I done this? If I want to teach this to somebody else, like, how do you recover from widowhood? How do you completely reimagine and reinvent yourself after a loss this huge? And I find that um, having some frameworks, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, um, and a whole lot of journaling is where it's at, because even as you're saying, like, how do we dismantle most widows and I didn't know this at the time either we don't understand that it's a million tiny things that we are reimagining and reinventing at any given moment and it's hard to know like where you're at in the process and we think that grief is this whole linear like here's the five stages and like you know you get a little brownie button when you get through the first one and now you're on the second level like this is not like a mario kart you know mario brothers you know you're advancing to the koopa troopa and then you go to level four right um so we have like it's everything starts with grief but like what you're grieving today may be different tomorrow. Like we're grieving the loss, but today I might be grieving the fact that I'm looking at selling his car and I'm really not ready to let go of it. Or today I'm grieving the fact that I realize like I haven't been touched, mm. you know, in nine months. Mm. Um, uh, or I'm grieving the fact that I've got to discipline a child and I don't have a clue what to do in this scenario and I don't have my partner to back me up, right? Mm -hmm. So journaling allows you to understand like what is the grief that you're really thinking of today? And then when you take those griefs, there is a process 
Karen and I, and I, and I'm interested with you as a coach, you know, how you interpret this, the words you put to this, we take each of these as a grief. How do we move these into a growth and then a transformation? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're just going to grieve them. Like there are Mm -hmm. days when like, I'm not ready to sell the truck. Mm -hmm. I'm still grieving the fact that I have to, that he's not driving it, that I have to let it go. I'm the one that has to do it. I have, or I have to put my name on that title by myself. Like there's grief and that has to be processed. You can't rush that. Mm -hmm. And I find that it helps when we acknowledge, Mm -hmm. I'm just not Mm -hmm. ready to let go of it today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do that another day. I'm still Mm -hmm. grieving it. Like just the acknowledgement gives us the permission Mm -hmm. to be where we are. But then there is like, there's a, like, we get to the point where it's like, I'm, I'm kind of done feeling this. I'm ready to move. I'm ready to do something. And this is where we start to choose. Do I keep it? Like, does it stay with me? Does it go with him kind of theoretically? Hmm. Or is there something completely new to take shape? And we do this with items. We do this with beliefs. We do this with traditions. You think about Christmas morning. Do the traditions we hold stay and we keep we keep doing them the way we always have? Do these traditions die away with him? Mm-hmm. And for the ones that do, what are the new ones that we start to welcome in or at least create space for something to take shape? Yeah. You know, and that's for every tiny minuscule aspect of reinventing our entire lives go through that sort of framework. Yeah. And that's a lot isn't it because when you break it down why we wonder why we can't get out of bed do you know how much framing reframing reimagining you had to do yesterday yes yeah for for, you know even like the food shopping you know like it 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 comes down to like your the the tasks that people wouldn't even necessarily think of (laughs) so people say to me i'm I'm still shopping for two or four or who you know because you, you can't get used to that there's one less person in the house to to feed and, and to cook for and it is it's it is absolutely processing all these tiny little things our, da- our daily structures because it does it impacts every corner of our universe and I think this is what people find so hard to understand you know and I and you know and I've always said <clears throat> this is just my belief from what I've observed is that I think there's two losses in life that impact every corner of your being. And I think it's a a life partner or a child, because I think with other losses, and I'm not, I'm not putting anything higher or greater or anything, you know, all loss is awful and sad and has an impact. However, when it's, you, you know, directly in your home, you haven't then got your normal to go back to. And that is where it becomes so big, doesn't it? Because, you know, there's not a lot of normal left. Yes, you might have the house that you lived in. Structurally, that's that's still there. But what is within those, those walls looks entirely, feels entirely, sounds entirely different, doesn't it? Yeah. And that's, I think that for us to understand and for others to understand is so huge and you're right you you know I think breaking it down like that and helping us understand that you know whilst we give ourselves a hard time for for not doing it well enough not doing it quickly enough you know feeling stuck and um, you know I'm not doing this as I should be doing it like just think about all the things that you're trying to process and work through there's so many of them yeah we don't do this for ourselves we look at all the things that we're not doing that we should be doing Yes, and this is I mean, I can't tell you uh, how many, you know, widows will 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 cry just going. I had no idea I was doing so much mm-hmm. like I look, you know, I, I'm looking at it now on paper. No wonder mm-hmm. I feel stuck. No wonder this is so hard. No wonder I can't get out of bed. No wonder I cannot see. <laughs> Yes. another human socially <laughs> I haven't got the capacity for anything else no wonder yeah 
Yeah, I know. It's it's massive, isn't it, Heather? It, it really is. So what do you think for you, you, you know, you say you've kind of reflected back and you can see all that because you, you're trying to, now, you know, you, you're now helping other widows. So you're trying to help them through that process. But when you were in it and you were going through it, do you think you realised at the time? Were you aware and, and, and had to consciously reframe how you saw those things? Or is it just looking back that you've been able to process that on that scale? You know, when, I'm in, when I was in it, um, you, just, you just feel that nothing helps. Yeah. So while I'm in it, you know, you're trying everything. It's just everything is scratching and clawing, mm. but you're getting nowhere. So I, I have these in my, my mind. Like I, I've, I have the gratitude, you know, that, that I got so much time with him in, in my life. I have so much gratitude that his life was what I think is perfection. He went out with a bang and I feel so good about the life I gave him while he was alive. You know, I, I have these, these, these gratitudes and, and, and memories that I cherish, but while you're in it and the grief is just so thick and you're just, you're just trapped. You're just incapable. You're just, you, you can't do anything, but feel the magnitude of the loss. It doesn't feel like it matters what you think, what you try you know it just mm. the burden is too heavy to carry yeah and that's a very real part of loss that looking back that's just part of it mm. part of it is is there's a point when the heaviness the weight you feel it mm. you know when let me try and explain this a little bit differently, Karen. You know, when we, when when we're first faced with this death, there's the sh the the shock, and the numbness, and and we're just cranking off the to do list and making things happen like us high achieving girls do, and you know, doing all the things that we can do, and and it's like, and it's like God gives you just a tiny glimpse. We we think it's massive, but if we're given the entirety of what we lost at once, mm -hmm. our, bodies can't, our bodies can't contain it. Our bodies can't contain it in the pieces we're given even. But it's like over time, we feel the bigger, bigger scope as more things as we start to see these and feel these secondary losses as you know the reality starts to set in, the numbness wears off, the shock wears off. And so there is a point I think in which we are feeling the full weight and gravity of it, it and, and you are incapable of moving and looking back i can see now that's where i was and that's why nothing helped nothing worked there was no happiness no joy there and that just if i can share with somebody who's in that now listening girl it won't be like that forever if you can just hold on to that, just, it can't be, like it can't be. I think it's possible, you know, if you can't imagine, I always tell people, do you think it could be possible that it won't always feel this heavy? If you can just hold on to that possibility and just repeat that, mm -hmm. anchor yourself in that glimmer, can't, there, I just, I have to believe that it's possible to not feel like this forever. Mm -hmm. Just hold on for that because that, that is not forever. That intensity, that weight, that gravity, that suffering, that deep darkness is not forever. But so it's true. Really and it's, it's so hard to see though, isn't it, when we're in it? Because you can't imagine, you, you know, when you can't get out of bed and your, your mood's not picking up and you don't want to see people, you know, and then you, you're layering it with that whole, well, I'm not doing this very well and I didn't want to be defined by my grief and, you know, I want to be a positive person and, and I'm not, you know, we put all that on ourselves as well, don't we? We kind of think, oh, no, you, you know, have I got it wrong? Have I failed? But, you, you know, you're can. right. People that are like, this is concerning. Yeah. Your behaviours are toxic. And I'm here to tell you, yeah. 
where you are is concerning. You lost your world. Yeah. When people tell you this is concerning, I'm afraid you're going to burn out. I'm, I'm afraid you're going off the deep end. Girl, you already are. Like, just own it. This mm. is what it looks like. Yeah, it should be concerning to you. It's concerning to me. I lost my life. And this is what it looks like. You know, I'm concerned for the kids. You should be. We lost everything. This is what it looks like in a home who has lost their pinnacle. Right. And and that piece, when we have the outside world telling us, oh, no, don't stay here not understanding this is way beyond toxic behavior this is way beyond concerning this is grief at mm -hmm. its finest and it like it has to bleed into you it ha you have to wear it you have it's part of the process there's no there's no like healthy way like healthy by societal standards way through because other people who aren't in it don't understand the healthiest thing to do is to just wear it until it wears off. Yeah, that's such good advice, isn't it? You know, it's such good advice because that's all we can do. You know, at the end of the day, like we, we can't box it up and put it away and, and ignore it. it. It needs to be felt. It needs to be worked through. It needs to be seen and heard and all that kind of stuff, doesn't it? which is something I know we find difficult to do, but mm -hmm. so important to find our way through it. So it's not heavy permanently and it's not that dark forever because, because it's not, and it's easy to say that to someone, isn't it? It's so, you know, people see us now, you know, years ahead and kind of think, well, you know, you're, you're, you're doing all right. You, you know, it's, it's okay for you because they can't see that we've been where they were. Um, and when you can't see something, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to imagine it, isn't it? And, and feel it to be, to be true. But, you know, you just hope that actually we were there. That was our reality. And, and you will work your way through it as well. You, you will find your way through it. What do you think is the, the best sort of mindset shift that, you know, we as widows can can ad adopt for ourselves to help us through our journey. You, you know, like you say, we were strong, independent women. And we find ourselves in, in this space where we're, you know, giving ourselves a really hard time. What do you think is one of the, the, the kind of most powerful, I suppose, shifts, perspective changes that, that we can take on to, to help us in our journey? I don't think it's like a shift or a perspective. It, it may be for some, but mm -hmm. I really believe in anchoring. Like what is your one truth, your one belief that through all of it, you will like when it gets so murky and you you're confused and you can't see where you're going, you can't see a way out of this tunnel. You're too deep. You're too far gone. Like what is what are you anchoring in to just keep yourself somewhat somewhat grounded within the shit storm mm -hmm. and those anchors for me are like we'll figure it out i don't know how but i i'm like i i'm open to how this life looks i'm i'm open um you know to receiving i'm i'm open to it looking different I'm open to other people coming into my life, my children's lives. I'm, I believe in a God who's holding me. I, 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 I believe in a, yeah. in a God that wants to see me and my children happy. I believe that we can. It's those, those beliefs have to, um, I, I don't, I don't know, Karen, how, people make it through without faith. Mm. And I don't mean religion and I don't mean God, but if faith is something you cannot see, mm. that you believe it. Mm. And whatever that is for you, religion or not, what are you holding in faith throughout the hardest experience and journey of your life? And they have to be truths that lift you even 
even a hair, just something that gives you the ability to wait it out one more half a second. Mm. You know, what you said there is it's kind of my mantra in life has become, I will figure it out because, you know, like after Simon died, um, I remember saying to my mum and my sister, and people have heard me saying this many a times, but I, you know, I said, I do not want this to define my life, my girls' lives in a negative way for the rest of our lives. I didn't know, you, you know, you know, in your life, I didn't know how I was going to make that happen, um, but I held on to it and I did make it happen. I figured it out, you, you know, and I've, I've kind of developed this mindset now of, you know, if I can figure out grief, who I am after my husband died, solo parenting, <laughs> running a home, homeschooling through a, a global pandemic, you know, all these things that you kind of go, yeah, they were tough. They were really tough. And they they pushed me, they tested me and, and I didn't enjoy it at, at all. It, it kind of, there were moments where you feel utterly broken, but I figured it out and I've now kind of got this outlook on life of, I, I will figure it out because that's what we do. You know, we kind of, we like to believe that we have a path in front of us, don't we? That we know exactly where we're heading, what we're doing and, and how that's all going to turn out. But we know full well, that we have absolutely no idea because, you know, one day you wake up and your husband drops down dead and that's it. All those, all those ideas, all those plans they're gone that that life that you thought you had is, is no longer there um so now it's a little bit more for me like yeah I, I do plan I do have ideas of what I like but I know that's not a given that's not certain but what I do know in life is sort of on the other side of that unknown that uncertainty I'll be okay because I'll figure it out because if I can figure all that out I could I can figure the rest of it out you, you know it, it's just what we do in life and I think we're all winging it aren't we <laughs> like, we're all winging it I think I think what we do and I think what you're describing is like detaching from the outcome like I don't really know how it's gonna look yeah but like whatever comes my way yeah. I'll figure it out we will make something beautiful out of it yes I I, I believe that yeah full heart like I don't, I don't know what my kids are going to do. I don't know what five years looks like. I don't even know what my career is going to be. You know, like, I don't know where I'm going to live, but whatever comes our way, I'm open to it. Mm. I'm open to accepting it. Mm -hmm. I'm open to diving into new opportunities. And if we can figure our way through this, mm. kind of makes everything else just a, like a bee sting. Yeah. <laughs> so true isn't it so true you know you're right and I think you know opening our hearts to, to new possibilities new opportunities is huge in it isn't it because I think you can be quite closed off initially because you're scared of the changes changes is frightening right because you know there's a a, a belief maybe that change is bad that if things look different it's not going to be good but actually different doesn't mean bad does it um it, yes it is going to look different but it can still be good and you have but you have to be open to that you know I think we really have to have this open heart this open mind to new ways to new possibilities to, to new opportunities and allowing ourselves to do that to try those things to go down that path rather than oh no 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 I can't I can't do that you, you know what will people think I'm being disloyal it's not fair because he's not alive and I'm supposed to be grieving and, and all these stories that we tell ourselves totally it's what you just said we have to allow you have to allow yourself allow yourself to find happiness allow yourself to be happy without him yeah. allow yourself to live life daring risky make mistakes not really know for sure how it's going to turn out we have to allow and give ourselves permission yeah. and just like you said like what hangs us up is what will other people think people might think i didn't love him enough mm. you know what would he think like all those things that say you shouldn't because we have to continue to be sad or 
Mm. Was it not real? Was it not Mm. enough? Was that not your one true love? And like that open heart is, I am going to choose to like love him and also continue living my life. Yes. Continue living my life. And and I, I, I believe it is a choice. I, I do believe and and there are there are things sometimes that are you, you know out of our control and and things that, that kind of you know reduce the choices that we can make I do I do understand that it's not that easy for everyone but there are a lot of choices that we are we are able to make that are within our power that we a lot of the time hold ourselves back from every like we have every choice uh you know no matter what global pandemic death loss of a job you know these are all things that happen to you Mm. we can't control them but at the end of the day everything we control is every thought Mm. that passes our mind and what we choose to do Mm. despite Mm. because of through what we've lived Mm. And that's, you know, for women like you, women that you work with, women like me, I'm choosing no matter what we, me and my children will have a happy life. Yes. Me and my children will learn how to rise when you don't get what you want in life. Yes. Me and my children will learn to figure it out no matter what devastation comes from us. We will learn how to be strong, resilient, choose joy every single time and seek peace. Yeah. For what we lost, what we can't control. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. What do you think has been like the biggest learning for you in in this? You, you know, your your loss, your journey through widowhood. What have you learned about yourself, about life? Do you think that that has has really helped you in this new life? The first thing that came to mind is, and I'm going to use this quote that we all know, but then I'm going to frame it differently. If it is to be, it is up to me. Mm. At the end of the day, you lost your greatest advocate, your greatest partner, your greatest love, you know, your greatest co-pilot, co-parent, um, you know, co-everything. And we immediately start to look for who can take care of us, who can make us feel better, who has the answers, what therapist, what therapy, what modality, what spiritual mentor, what doctor has the answers to make you feel better. And at the end of the day, the only person that you can rely on with 100% accuracy is you. Mm -hmm. And once I realized I have to stop looking for the friends who are looking out for me, stop looking for the people who are gonna be our village and take care of us. Stop seeking professionals that are finally gonna give me the answer to make all this pain go away and realized it's on me, like radical responsibility. It's both sobering awful and very empowering at the same time. Yes. I want to mow the lawn, but I ran out of gas and I'm not even sure what oil it takes. Mm. I can sit there and let that lawnmower sit for the next month and nothing will happen. I got to go figure it out. Mm. You know, I sold a business. The woman I sold to stopped paying me payments. I better figure out how to make that money up Mm. in case she doesn't do it. Like it's all on me. And, and like I said, that's, that's a hard one to square, Mm. but once I just owned it Mm. and stepped into it, I found healing started to come a lot quicker. I can totally resonate with that. And I, and I love that quote. Um, I haven't actually heard that one before. Um, I love it but it's um a a quote that kind of changed things for me was um your wound is probably not your fault but your healing is your responsibility and it's it's the same thing isn't it um because you're right we it no one's coming to save us no one one. nothing (laughs) 
like you have to do the work you have to do the work you have to take responsibility you have to learn how to love care and nurture yourself and that is a whole different ball game because we're not used to doing that either mm-hmm. but it's possible it's you possible. know it is possible and you know if I can do it you can do it like I kind of go well then everyone can do it because we're no different to anyone else and yeah all right some people could say well you had some prior knowledge because you were a coach and and that before but you still trying to navigate grief which nobody knew anything about before you know and having to use the knowledge and what you had to, to help you and the truth is I think we all had skills that we had before our person died that we can utilize in in our new life you know it's just switching them out of it isn't it you, you yes. know it, yeah yeah and, and, and we can think that we don't know we don't understand but actually we know a lot we know a lot we and and what's really important to remember for me is what I love to, to remind people about all the time is you have all the answers like everything you need is within you it's all there. We feel like it's not because we don't, we don't have the, the answer straight away. They don't come to us like that, but they will come. You know, it's just giving them the, the time and the space to reveal themselves without putting any pressure on it. But it all comes, doesn't it? It does all come. Yes. And, and, and I have to say too, like anybody who's listening to your podcasts, anybody who's watching this video on whatever you know, platform is a resource seeker. You are seeking resources, guidance, truths, answers. You, this is what part of doing the work is. You are seeking outside yourself. Um, because while I say it's on us, we have to do it alone. You actually can't. And this is like, this is where we have to, like, if I'm on my own in this house and i'm not listening to anything watching reading just listening to my own mind karen that is like (laughs) that's a death sentence let me be honest right we be very intentional about what you're seeking to be influenced by and this is so key for us widows we have to welcome in other voices perspectives ideas, thoughts, hire the therapist, you know, go to counseling, you know, go to yoga, do the pod, you know, listen to the podcast, read all of the books, because it's, it's these tiny little threads that help you figure out your path. We don't listen to them because, oh, I heard this from this Heather Quizzle girl and I just need to do what she says and everything's going to be fine. You may take one sliver, one just tiny little thread, but you're we're weaving every single day and we're weaving together this what we call a healing journey Mm. and you have to pull from like I will never get enough of seeking the experience of other widows other loss survivors, other tragedy survivors, because every single one of them has survived and they've done it. We do it a million different ways, but I want that in my body, those reminders that humans are resilient, whether you're resistant to that word or not, Mm -hmm. we are freaking resilient. We are wired to adapt. Yeah. Allow yourself the adaptation but also like allow yourself to be influenced by the right people who have the right mindset, the right experience, the right wisdom. It's yeah. the wisdom that I'm after that all oh. comes from life experience. 100%. And I'm still doing all that now. I still read the books and listen to the podcasts and, you know, I surround myself with people that just give me all these little threads, these little golden nuggets everywhere. And, and like, you don't you don't get to the end of this there's no destination it's like we're on this path and we keep learning and we keep growing and we keep finding ways but you're so right you know it is our responsibility we do have to find our way through it in the best way for us but we don't have to do it 
on our own and and we shouldn't do either you, to your point you know we are designed for connection for community we we are not meant to do these things on our own you know it's hard if you're going to try and do this all by yourself it's going to be really hard but to your point people listening to this watching this they're not trying to do that because they are seeking out the resources to help them so they can weave their own little threads together and the things that resonate with them to help them find their way through this and it's it's hard it's so hard it's exhausting however it's also very very transformative I think and yeah. very you know if you allow it to be very empowering so I have um I have this uh client this widow a uh, friend of mine and and she was sharing this week um she was given this advice this is so good um right after her husband James passed away a friend said make a list of all of your people and all of his people and who you go to for what. Because while we are on our own, learning to ask for help is everything. We have to, this is how we learn by asking others. Like my, my lawnmower is not working. Like I'm gonna run down to the hardware store and ask somebody there, or I'm gonna call a friend. But what, what she suggested and what she had done is make a list like, I go to this friend for anything that's garage yeah. malfunction. I go to this friend if I have car trouble. I go to this friend if I just need to drink wine and talk. You know, I call this friend if I need, you know, something with my children or and and, and just having that village, you know, list out who are your supports. But you have to ask. You have to tell them what you need. Um because they're guessing mm. and they're failing mm. and they want so desperately to help. And the minute you ask for that, they just have been given the opportunity to like rise to the occasion. It's one of the greatest gifts it we is. can give our people in the aftermath. You're so right. People want to help, they, but they don't know how, you, you know, they're, they're stumbling through the dark, you know, they know less than we do about it and we know very little. Um, so I think that's a great idea, a great tip, you know, to, to help you just figure out who you can ask, you, you know, who, what you need from who, if that makes sense. <laughs> but yes, you get, you get the gist. And what are they your go-to for? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Heather, it has been so lovely talking to you. You are so wise. You have shared so much here. And I think, you know, so many are going to get so much from it. What do you do now? I know you you have your your Instagram reels where you just are brilliant, as I said at the beginning. So I'll, I'll pop that in the show notes so people can follow you there. But do you have other ways you support widows? Yes, um, this has become just something I can't not do is uh, serving those who um, have been in the same place. Um, I have opened the doors to a program called Real Widowhood and it's dissecting the actual process and frameworks. And just like we talked about the million little adjustments that we have to make to reimagine and reinvent our lives. Um, and so I've just allowed at this phase of my life in this portion of my journey to just be a vessel and a servant for, for women in this space. And, you know, I'm just allowing, I'm just allowing to what comes after to come after. Love it. Open. <laughs> Very oh, that's so lovely, Heather. And and honestly, I think you know, you you already help people in so many ways with with you know your presence on social media. You offer so much hope. And this has been a wonderful conversation to have with you. I could go on and on and on. <laughs> I know. But you know widows in a room. In yeah, real that's life. It. <laughs> so much to say <laughs> but no thank you so much Heather it's been an absolute pleasure you too thank you Karen <laughs>